Now the three martini lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Thursday edition of the three martini lunch. Andrew Johnson of National Review is in for Jim Garrity today. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. We always have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives, and that is the case once again today. And almost a little bit of a double shot here in martini number one, the good martini, and that's that in two really big states where Democrats usually have a lock on one of the governorships and certainly are competitive in the other, look to be very much in the Republican column. Uh, We'll get to the really fun story in just a minute, but uh, the more in-depth one is what's happening in Ohio Uh, John Kasich won a really tough battle against Governor Ted Strickland in 2010. Kasich's poll numbers tanked when he kind of followed along in Scott Walker's footsteps on the collective bargaining issue. He didn't make conservatives very happy when he embraced uh, expansion of Medicaid. But in his campaign against Ed Fitzgerald, John Kasich has done considerably better, especially in the last few weeks, as Fitzgerald was found at one point to have been in a car with a woman who wasn't his wife at 4.30 in the morning. Turns out he hasn't had a driver's license for years. His campaign staff is quitting on him in droves. Larry Sabato has the race now as safe Republican. And you know you're in trouble, Andrew, when the Washington Post version of the story online has a picture of an imploding apartment building on top and says that Ed Fitzgerald's campaign is essentially packing it in and he's going to basically spend most of his money helping down-ballot candidates not get wiped out as a result of his lackluster performance at the top of the ticket. So pretty hard to get a better scenario than that if you're John Kasich in the GOP. Yeah, and it's a good sign because, again, I think a year ago people thought this race would be a lot more competitive than it is. Ohio is a very crucial swing state. It's just always hard to gauge sort of where that's going to go. But the fact that it's leaning Republican uh, in a year when also, and we'll get into this when we get to our our next little item, (laughs) is that this is supposed to be a big, massive Republican wave election in a lot of ways in the Senate. And the governorship, though, is a little bit different for Republicans. There's a lot of seats that they are going to have a little bit of trouble holding on to, it looks like, just because these are all the 2010 governors. Uh, But the fact that we can kind of put Ohio safely uh, in our back pocket, it looks like it looks like it's going to go our way. Assuming Fitzgerald just keeps being Fitzgerald. It's nice to have that one safe. Absolutely. And it has 2016 implications. It didn't, unfortunately, in 2012. But one of the reasons the Obama White House really wanted Uh, Kasich to lose in 2010 was so they'd have the state apparatus uh, at at their disposal in in 2012. Turns out they won Ohio anyway. But uh, if, in fact, this turns out to be a pretty easy John Kasich reelection, it not only means that the Republican nominee will have an advantage, but they've got the convention in Ohio and got a Democratic Party potentially in shambles there. So that that, that all kind of works to uh, conservatives advantage to some extent. So um, we'll keep watching that one. The other one real quickly is in Illinois, which is usually a deep blue state. But Pat Quinn has never been very popular, including coming in on the heels of Rod Blagojevich. He's losing in the polls to the uh, very wealthy Republican nominee, Rauner, in, in that state. It's double digits last I saw with Quinn still in the 30s. He tried to uh, whip up some local support for himself when the Jackie Robinson Little League team, it's the national champion team that won the U.S. portion of the Little League World Series. They didn't win the the, the final game, but they were having a a welcome home rally, and uh, this is how the governor was greeted at the event. Please give it up for our governor, Pat Quinn. Make some noise. Everybody say, hey, Pat. I thought you was getting ready to slide. You know, you could say that that was off mic and you really don't know what the uh, level of enthusiasm was, but you can actually hear individual hands clapping in the background (laughs) there. And that's never a good sign for a politician. Yeah, and I'd like to think maybe that's, you know, people don't even realize why they're clapping. It's just sort of like an instinctive response or something because it was so few that, that you know, maybe there they were just some Quinn fans there that were really excited to see him. <laughs> Both of but them. Yeah, yeah, I'll play, yeah, both of them. If you do look up the video, you can even see like the kids that are uh, that are sort of in the area with him. <laughs> they're not even engaged. You know, it's their it's their governor, and he's here to welcome them. And they're half of them are sort of looking the other direction. So even they, you know, they they felt the the troubles of the Quinn administration. But uh, there are going to be some tough seats for Republicans that they need to hold on to. I mean, seats like Scott Walker or Brown back in Kansas. Uh, those are ones that, again, we picked up in 2010. They're looking like they're going to be tougher than the, perhaps we were hoping. It's nice to have some races like Quinn that sort of also put Democrats on their heels and make them a little nervous, put them on defense as well. So it's going to be interesting to see. Sort of, again, we've been talking a lot about the Senate races uh, coming up in 2014, but 
in in some in a lot of ways the governor's race is going to be interesting for both sides of it. Very important. That's your bench for 2020 and possibly even 2016, uh, depending on how some of those races turn out. And, and just to be fair here, uh, it's also. Equally as bad uh, in Pennsylvania, Tom Corbett, I saw the latest poll. Uh, this is a Republican who was elected in 2010. Uh, he's losing by 25 points, which is bad enough. He only has 24 uh, in the poll. Uh, <laughs> so if you're an incumbent at 24. And in a good Republican year. It's, yes. you know, it's, it's nice to have case, people like Kasich in our, back, in, in, in our back pocket and solid and you know, being on offense against Quinn because we do have our own troubles. I mean, we do, like I said, we have the Walkers, the Brownbacks, uh, Rick Scott in Florida, Snyder in Michigan. I mean, right. LePage in Maine. I mean, again, we do, we do have our issues as well. So it's nice when we can go on offense against the Democrats on their home turf. Definitely. All right. So now to the bad martini now. And a couple of different Republican groups, two in particular, uh, Crossroads GPS and American Action Network, did a major survey among women to see how the Republican Party is viewed. Andrew, the results were not good. Essentially, the key phrases that they highlighted in this report were intolerant, lacking in compassion, and stuck in the past. And now there are, of course, all sorts of different analyses about what the party can do in the coming months and certainly in the years ahead to try and relate better to women, uh, but it looks as though the uh, goals of the post-Mitt Romney uh, loss report from the RNC doesn't look like there's a lot of momentum in that department yet. Uh, I feel like we've been having this bad martini for a while. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why we don't try ordering something else, but <laughs> but I mean, th- this poll was definitely not a very good sign for us, and in almost uh, Corbett-esque fashion, I mean, when you sort of looked at some of the details, we were down pretty big to Democrats on issues like Health care, I think we had something like a 40-point disadvantage when it comes to Democrats as far as who, who cares more about these issues or who's looking out for the interest of women. I think we had something in the 30s. I mean, these these are sizable gaps that Republicans have been trying to address for the, for the past couple of years after the Mitt Romney election. And I guess going into 2014, you have to, you have to hope that this isn't going to come back to bite us, that we're not going to think, you know, what, what happened here? I thought we've been working towards all this. Now, the one positive part of it is that we have we do have an advantage among married women, but we do struggle pretty mightily against uh, single women. I'm just going to make that point. Uh, certainly the result of the Virginia governor's race is that uh, Ken Cuccinelli uh, won among married women. And so the question now for the Republicans is, first of all, what draws the single women to the Democrats in huge numbers? And obviously this poll will give some indication, but uh is it issues that most Republicans and conservatives see as pandering, like the, the free birth control and the life of Julia and all that kind of stuff? Does that actually work? And if it does, we're kind of in a pickle. That could be part of it. I mean, there were some also interesting findings that, that again, this isn't all just gloom and doom. I think there is some takeaways from this. I found it interesting that as far as abortion, they say that they just want Republicans to sort of speak honestly on it rather than sort of skirt around it, which admittedly Republicans have been doing. That They're sort of scared to, to, to really perhaps discuss that and talk about that. But I mean, as far as what you were saying, sort of the pandering and whatnot, if, if that's how it's phrased, uh, it showed equal pay, for example, among uh, that issue of equal pay for women is something that that's, that's a big no-no for, for, for women voters as far as Republican policies go. And, uh, and that's just something that the GOP is going have to have to find a way to address. All right. On to the crazy martini now. And one of the things Jim has been very excited about pointing out ever since uh, he started working on the weed agency is different areas of the government spending our tax dollars in, let's just say, questionable ways. This is the latest one from the folks at Fermilab. This is reported by Hotair.com. Do we live in a 2D hologram? And this is questioning whether or not our universe is a hologram. There's no short answer, but physicists believe it may be possible. The holographic principle, a property of particle physics string theory, proposes that information about a region of space can be ascertained by the information on the surface that surrounds it, much like you can determine, say, currents in water by the eddies on the surface. And it goes on and on. Uh, But here's the situation. According to their own economic impact studies, when it comes to their cash flow, the overwhelming majority of the funds for this project were from the federal government, with the lion's share coming from the Department of Energy. That would be 94%, by the way, coming from the federal government. Their total annual budget is nearly half a billion dollars. Andrew, there's a lot of needs right now. Border comes to mind. Uh, Military comes to mind. A lot of other things I'm sure would pop in other people's minds. But uh, figuring out if we live in a hologram seems to be a little bit higher than it probably should be. Yeah, I mean, I'm always hesitant to sort of criticize these studies because if they, you know, end up being right, I don't want to be the one that was like 
I guess we do live in a hologram. What's going on here? <laughs> but but I don't know if right this moment is when we need to discover that. I guess whatever we can take from this, it's always, it's always interesting to, to, to learn this sort of stuff. But as far as priorities go, it's sort of up there with all these other studies that we hear about from time to time. You know, the, the various mating habits of whatever animal out there, or video game studies and, and simulations that, that the government will fund and look into. Or even just reading this, I was reminded of, uh, another potential spending boondoggle, which was those training videos that were like Star Trek spoofs. Do you remember those? I think they're <laughs> yeah. like IRS training videos. Yes. Hopefully this, I guess, scientific endeavor is a lot more substantive than what that was. I did like, though, that they are going to be using something called the hollow meter, which is, quote, the most sensitive instrument ever built to measure the quantum jitter of space, which I don't know <laughs> what that is, but it sounds made up. And I always like when things that sound made up end up being real things. <laughs> <laughs> Like flux capacitors, if that ended up being real or something. Yeah, <laughs> that would be fantastic. I guess we're learning more about the quantum jitter, even if uh, <laughs> even if it's maybe not the right time and place to do it. <laughs> Andrew, thanks for filling in. We'll talk to you later. Take it easy. Thank you. Andrew Johnson of National Review. In for Jim Garrity. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Just a heads up, there will be no three martini lunch on Friday or Monday. So join Jim Garrity and me on Tuesday for the next three martini lunch.